So I just wanted to welcome everyone to today's webinar. We're gonna be talking about PTSD and prolonged grief disorder. Um, my name's Kylie Hanish. I'm the founder of RTZ Hope. And I'm really loving being able to put out these very informative webinars. Um, in this case, this is for providers. And I'm, I'm especially excited about today's topic because it's so relevant to the population of parents that we serve that when, when we lose a baby, the mental health implications are very complicated. And so I'm excited for this very informed discussion and um, just Jen has done a lot of pulling together research to provide us with information to like what the current situation on both, both of these diagnoses is. So um, I will go ahead and start by introducing Jen Judana Almadi, and she is a member of our clinical advisory board. Um, and just Jen, thank you so much for being here and, and doing this webinar for us. Absolutely. Um, so Jen owns a clinical private practice specializing in the treatment of trauma-related conditions as well as perinatal mental health. She lives in Indiana and Jen began focusing her own practice towards trauma and maternal health following her own traumatic birth experience, after which she noted a significant deficit in the assessment, diagnosis, and treatment of trauma-related conditions in the maternal population. So Jen has an extended knowledge of evidence-based treatments for trauma-related conditions, including EMDR, cognitive processing therapy, and prolonged exposure therapy. And I'm just really, really excited and grateful for her for, again, for just being here. And I know that you all are going to love this presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to let Jen um, take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Kylie. I'm really honored to be here and really grateful for all the participants. Um, and I hope that they find this helpful. Um, as I meant, as Kylie mentioned, I'm a clinical social worker. Um, I live in Indiana, but I'm also licensed in Ohio and Massachusetts. And um, I appreciate all of you joining us today. Your participation reflects your genuine concern for your clients and your commitment to professionalism within our community. And I really appreciate you taking the time to expand your knowledge and to reinforce your clinical abilities. Before we start, um, I would like to take a moment to reflect on why you are here today. Maybe it's a specific client you're working with, a personal experience that's led to your desire to grow, or a general interest in expanding your clinical toolbox. I would just ask that you invest this time on behalf of that motivation, allowing yourself to receive as intended. And I also would ask you to take a moment to ask yourself, what might I be willing to do to meet that aim? I will offer on my behalf and the best of my knowledge, my skills, and my abilities to support you in reaching that end. So let's get started. Today, I'm gonna to be discussing post-traumatic stress disorder and prolonged grief disorder, highlighting the clinical differences, exploring assessment tools and risk factors, and appropriate evidence-based treatments. We're gonna be exploring this in reference to the adult population, and this webinar is designed as a forward-facing resource in that it's working to align our clinical work with the most recent changes and some of the clinical definitions and applications associated with prolonged grief. So rather than focusing on our prior uh, clinical definitions and our present, we are moving forward here in the next year or two to some new definitions. And I thought it might be more beneficial to focus on the future. 
PTSD and prolonged grief disorder are two different clinical issues, and they do carry some similar symptoms. So it's my hope that today's meeting will better clarify these different aspects of each condition and ways to best address the various needs of individuals in these clinical populations, okay? So we're gonna start by learning a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm gonna start by showing you a video. Many of us will experience some kind of trauma during our lifetime. Sometimes we escape with no long-term effects, but for millions of us, those experiences linger, causing symptoms like flashbacks, nightmares, and negative thoughts that interfere with everyday life. This phenomenon, called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, isn't a personal failing. Rather, it's a treatable malfunction of certain biological mechanisms that allow us to cope with dangerous experiences. To understand PTSD, we first need to understand how the brain processes a wide range of ordeals, including the death of a loved one, domestic violence, injury or illness, abuse, rape, war, car accidents and natural disasters. These events can bring on feelings of danger and helplessness, which activate the brain's alarm system, known as the fight, flight, freeze response. When this alarm sounds, the hypothalamic, pituitary and adrenal systems, known as the HPA axis, work together to send signals to the autonomic nervous system. That's the network that communicates with adrenal glands and internal organs to help regulate functions like heart rate, digestion and respiration. These signals start a chemical cascade that floods the body with several different stress hormones, causing physiological changes that prepare the body to defend itself. Our heart rate speeds up, breathing quickens, and muscles tense. Even after a crisis is over, escalated levels of stress hormones may last for days, contributing to jittery feelings, nightmares, and other symptoms. For most people, these experiences disappear within a few days to two weeks as their hormone levels stabilize. But a small percentage of those who experience trauma have persistent problems, sometimes vanishing temporarily, only to resurface months later. We don't completely understand what's happening in the brain, but one theory is that the stress hormone cortisol may be continuously activating the fight, flight, freeze response while reducing overall brain functioning, leading to a number of negative symptoms. These symptoms often fall into four categories, intrusive thoughts like dreams and flashbacks, avoiding reminders of the trauma, negative thoughts and feelings like fear, anger, and guilt, and reactive symptoms like irritability and difficulty sleeping. Not everyone has all these symptoms or experiences them to the same extent and intensity. When problems last more than a month, PTSD is often diagnosed. Genetics, ongoing overwhelming stress, and many risk factors like pre-existing mental illnesses or lack of emotional support likely play a role in determining who will experience PTSD. But the underlying cause is still a medical mystery. A major challenge of coping with PTSD is sensitivity to triggers, physical and emotional stimuli that the brain associates with the original trauma. These can be everyday sensations that aren't inherently dangerous, but prompt powerful physical and emotional reactions. For example, the smell of a campfire could evoke the memory of being trapped in a burning house. For someone with PTSD, that memory activates the same neurochemical cascade as the original event. That then stirs up the same feelings of panic and helplessness, as if they're experiencing the trauma all over again. Trying to avoid these triggers, which are sometimes unpredictable, can lead to isolation. That can leave people feeling invalidated, ignored or misunderstood like a pause button has been pushed on their lives while the rest of the world continues around them. But there are options. If you think you might be suffering from PTSD, the first step is an evaluation with a mental health professional who can direct you towards the many resources available. Psychotherapy can be very effective for PTSD, helping patients better understand their triggers. And certain medications can make symptoms more manageable as can self-care practices like mindfulness and regular exercise. 
What if you notice signs of PTSD in a friend or family member? Social support, acceptance and empathy are key to helping and recovery. Let them know you believe their account of what they're experiencing and that you don't blame them for their reactions. If they're open to it, encourage them to seek evaluation and treatment. PTSD has been called the hidden wound because it comes without outward physical signs. But even if it is an invisible disorder, it doesn't have to be a silent one. Okay, so in this video, we see some very clear clinical aspects present in PTSD. Intrusions, these intrusive thoughts, they can be nightmares, flashbacks, re-experiencing, avoidance symptoms, avoiding thoughts, any kind of reminders associated with the trauma, negative cognitions, and strong feelings of fear, anxiety, sometimes guilt and shame, and this heightened arousal, this hyper arousal. So what's happening in the brain? This, this video touches on it briefly, and I'm going to show you another video just to get into a little more depth about this. Trauma and the brain. When the brain becomes stressed in response to a traumatic event, the reptilian and mammalian brain centers take over and shut down higher brain function. The body's fight or flight response becomes highly engaged. The brain's only job now is to anticipate, prevent, or protect someone from potential dangers. To do this, it relies on automatic processes that, in general, bypass the parts of the brain involved with learning and making conscious judgments about situations. This is termed survival brain. PTSD occurs when the brain becomes injured and is unable to reset itself after a traumatic event. The survival brain state becomes stuck and the brain can no longer regulate itself. When this happens, the brain can no longer distinguish what is safe from what is unsafe, and it views every stressor, even normal everyday ones, as serious and potentially life-threatening. The brain can no longer tell the difference between imagining the traumatic event and actually experiencing it. Imagining the event sets off the same brain stimuli that the real event did. Therefore, images in the mind feel real in the body. What is? Okay. So what this second video reinforces is that for individuals suffering from PTSD, we find that the survival brain has basically hijacked the system. The higher level cognitive functioning is on pause. And this results in these individuals being unable to process and make sense of their trauma. And this impacts their ability to interact in life experiencing normal aspects as dangerous and threatening. And it's a very scary and debilitating condition, which if not treated, can impact nearly every area of life. Okay, it's interesting to note that most individuals who experience a trauma meet the criteria for PTSD within the first 60 days. That's, that's pretty typical. However, in the normal course of recovery, these often subside with time, usually within three months. When present during the first month, these symptoms clinically correlate with the condition we identify as acute stress disorder. And if they continue beyond the first month and they are impacting functioning, we would then consider a diagnosis of PTSD. While uncommon, PTSD can develop months or years after a trauma. And these usually seem to correlate with an individual experiencing a major life stressor or a trauma that might relate in some way to the origin trauma. Now I've included this slide as a reference for the current DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. And this is located in section two and is listed under trauma and stressor-related disorders. The criteria listed here is for adults, adolescents, and children over the age of six. Children have a separate criteria. I will draw your attention to the specifiers relating to dissociative symptoms, as well as delayed onset. We wanna always assess for that. And I'd also point out that this condition occurs more frequently amongst females, 
and has been found to last longer in females than in male populations. So just briefly looking at the diagnostic criteria, we have an exposure to a trauma. In uh, section B, we want to at least see one or more intrusion symptoms. Part C, we, we would look at avoidance, at least one or more avoidance symptom. D, negative cognition and mood, two or more negative cognition or mood symptoms. Uh, e, hyperarousal, at least two or more marked alterations in trauma-related arousal and activity. And again, these need to be impairing functioning. They need to be present for at least one month or more. And uh, they're not due to any other factor. So now we're going to move into prolonged grief disorder, okay? Um, let's explore prolonged grief disorder and what it is. Now, this is an excellent question, and it really depends on who you're talking to and where you look, and I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. Some researchers still disagree about how best to characterize persistent grief. So I want to touch on the clinical definitions here. We've seen previous terms such as persistent complex bereavement disorder, complicated grief, traumatic grief, and so forth. Currently, the DSM-5 classifies problematic grief under Section 3. This is under conditions for further study. And it identifies the clinical term persistent complex bereavement disorder, whereas the World Health Organization working under the ICD is in process of adopting this term prolonged grief disorder. The American Psychiatric Association has proposed to change the position of disturbed grief in the current DSM-5 and replacing the criteria for persistent complex bereavement disorder for criteria for prolonged grief disorder and moving it to section two. Uh, this novel diagnosis will share its name with the grieving disorder, prolonged grief disorder, which is put forth in the ICD-11. However, the criteria do not completely overlap the proposed DSM criteria is kind of, you know, it's taking it out of the area of further study, it's putting it in section two, and it's kind of defining it under these clinical um, symptoms. So I want to briefly touch on these. A, the death of a loved one 12 months earlier. Pay attention to that, 12 months. B, intense yearning and preoccupation. C, three of eight symptoms occurring for over one month. So we've had this, this death experience, a whole year has gone by and they have these symptoms for one month. Uh, so three of eight, identity disruption, disbelief, avoidance, emotional pain, difficulty moving on, numbness, sense that life is meaningless, loneliness, this is causing distress or disability. And part E, this is important. It exceeds the cultural and contextual norms not explained by another mental health condition. Now, this might vary based on the context and the culture of the individual with whom you're, you're working. Okay. So as I said, pay attention to that 12 months. Uh, the new criteria will correlate well with the ICD-11 symptom list. However, the timing of diagnosis doesn't change in the DSM-5. So it's leaving this cutoff at 12 months for adults and six months for children. The ICD-11 prolonged grief disorder allows for diagnosis as early as six months post-loss. While the diagnosis in the DSM-5 text revision, which we're moving toward here, sets that 12 months as the threshold. Um, and there's a debate around this. There's a debate around that cutoff point. Some researchers believe that if you're suffering for an entire year, psychopathology is so pervasive 
that an individual has become completely consumed by their symptoms. And it's much more difficult to head out of that tunnel of distress. But there are many that believe that the DSM uh, five is not giving us enough, um, not intervening early enough here, uh, which could provide, they say, for better clinical outcomes. And then we have some that say, no, no, grief takes time. And it's likely that these symptoms aren't going to fully present until after a year. And this debate is ongoing, okay? So I did wanna include this slide, which considers important definitions if you're not uh, working with be bereavement in general. So bereavement is the experience of the death of a loved one. Grief is the response to the loss. Acute grief is the initial all-encompassing emotional experience. And this is what is becoming transformed in the process of healing. It's time limited, it's a learning process. An adaptive usual grief is the psychological process that facilitates adaptation to loss and it's the reshaping of the grief. It's an acknowledging of the reality of the loss, the finality and the associated consequences of that. Um, it's an allowing of the loved one to become a part of us in our memory system rather than still here physically. And it's seeing our future in new ways through emotional regulation. And it's also kind of building of supports, a new, a new way of seeing life, okay? So what we're really looking to move toward is this integrated grief. This is the form that grief takes after an adaptation to the loss. And with prolonged grief disorder, we're not able to integrate that grief. And this is what we want to help our clients uh, develop and work toward. So the reality of the loss being accepted, yearning and longing no longer dominating the mind, positive emotions being present and just as prominent as the negative ones. Thoughts of the deceased being accessible to the individual, comforting and bittersweet at the same time. We want someone to feel a sense of self again. A lot of times we're so connected to our identity and relationship to the individual we've lost, we, we don't know who we are anymore. We want our, our client to have a sense of purpose, well-being, um, a restoration of the potential for happiness again, to feel connected to others and to be re-engaged in life. So prolonged grief is this lack of progression in that grieving process, and it's a stuckness in grief. When someone moves through that process in a healthy way, They've integrated the grief and that's what we're hoping to achieve. And in order to do that, we need to assess properly. So now we're gonna talk about assessment, both in PTSD and prolonged grief. Okay, so PTSD or, or originates from an activation of the body's fear response system. And it's related to an inability to process integrate and make appropriate meaning of the emotions, sensations, and thoughts associated with the trauma experience. Whereas prolonged grief disorder relates to difficulty accepting and making meaning of the loss. Prolonged grief disorder is a stuckness in grief rather than a stuckness in fear, which is the hallmark of PTSD. So it's our job as clinicians to assess what is the target here? Is it being stuck in fear or is it being stuck in grief and loss and inability to move forward? And usually there are cognitive correlates, beliefs that are associated with each, with each of these conditions. So for example, PTSD, there's a huge piece of safety, thoughts related to safety. It's not safe to be in the world. It's not safe to trust. I can't trust myself. Um, whereas with prolonged grief disorder, it's the stuckness in the loss. It's the stuckness in um, an inability to move forward. So I cannot move on. I can't see my future anymore. 
So, you know, these are these big differences. The other thing we see with PTSD as far as differences, there is this heightened arousal. Think about this. When you're talking to your client, if they're having nightmares, flashbacks, they see it happening over and over again. You got to pay attention to that. Listen to them. And if they're saying these things, you really need to consider assessing for PTSD. Okay. So assessment with PTSD. Uh, it's important to take into account several factors, including your clinical intake interview, an assessment of risk factors, a case history, including a trauma history. We know that individuals with childhood trauma are more likely to develop PTSD. We want to look at the onset of the symptoms, their impact on functioning, and we want to start planning. If we think they have PTSD, we're doing the assessment. What evidence-based treatment are we going to use and what evidence-based diagnostic measure are we going to use to ensure that we're assessing appropriately, okay? So in regard to PTSD and an easy to administer adult assessment tool, we have the CAPS-5, which is a 30 item structured interview that can be used to make current PTSD diagnosis over the past month, a lifetime diagnosis of PTSD, and assess for PTSD symptoms over the past week. It can be administered by clinicians and clinical researchers or an appropriately trained paraprofessional who have a strong working knowledge of PTSD, and it takes approximately 45 to 60 minutes. The PCL-5 post-traumatic stress disorder checklist is a 20 item self-report measure that assesses the 20 DSM-5 symptoms of PTSD. And it has a variety of purposes. It can be used as a monitoring tool to monitor symptom change during and after treatment. It can be used to screen individuals for PTSD. And it can also be uh, used as a provisional PTSD diagnostic tool. But as previously mentioned, the gold standard is a structured clinical interview, such as the clinician administered PTSD scale, the CAPS-5. And I also want to make a note here. When a diagnosis of PTSD is made, it's important to consider the PTSD diagnosis as comorbid unless proven otherwise. Okay. Risk factors. Research has demonstrated that the severity and nature of trauma has an impact on the development of PTSD. And we know that the highest rates of PTSD occur among cases of interpersonal violence. Furthermore, a childhood history of trauma correlates with an increased risk of the development of PTSD. And I've included um, the name of a brief kind of screening tool to explore, and it's called the uh, early childhood, uh, the ACEs, adverse childhood experience skill. So we want to, you can just administer, administer this, screen them. And if it, they score very high, that might be something to use to further assess for childhood trauma. Um, poor coping strategies, a lack of social supports, a family trauma history, and low heart rate variability also correlate with an increased risk of the development of PTSD. And recent studies have shown a link between low cortisol levels at the time of trauma exposure and the development of PTSD. And so interesting to note, Zohar et al. published a paper in 2011 in which hydrocortisone therapy applied immediately after trauma actually reduce the development of the condition. So we're learning more about the biological underpinnings of this condition. And there is some other research now demonstrating a relationship with, between smaller hippocampus and the higher risk of PTSD. Um, so three different studies have shown that people with chronic PTSD have decreased hippocampal volumes. While researchers have yet to find a complete assessment tool that fully assesses all the diagnostic criteria for prolonged grief disorder, 
we do have several tools that can serve as a guide for our clinical assessment. So let's talk a little bit about that. The Prolonged Grief Disorder Scale, PG-13, is a really good starting point to assess for characteristics consistent with prolonged grief disorder. There was a study conducted in 2009 by Pigerson et al., which found both the Inventory of Complicated Grief, the ICG, and the Inventory of Complicated Grief Revised Edition, the ICGR, to demonstrate high reliability in assessing for clinical symptoms associated with prolonged grief disorder. So all of those may be appropriate measures to begin that process. And I've also included some other measures uh, which could prove effective in assessing for prolonged grief disorder. Um, as an added note, there is an evidence of a six to 11 times greater risk of suicidality among individuals suffering from prolonged grief disorder. So anyone who meets this criteria should be assessed for suicide risk. Uh, some risk fa factors for prolonged grief. 10 to 15% of bereaved people in the general population experience problematic adaptation to grief. And there's an increased rate when the death is sudden, unexpected, or violent, and when a young person dies. There's an increased risk when there's a prior history of a mood or anxiety disorder, and women are at a higher risk than men. This next statistic was really astounding to me. 20%, 20% of people receiving mental health treatment have unrecognized prolonged grief disorder. And that's according to the Center for Complicated Grief, who's worked with the National Institute of Mental Health, and they've done a lot of research on this. So imagine you have 10 clients, two of them, are we assessing for this? Randomized clinical trials show an association between depression, anxiety, PTSD, and prolonged grief. So we do need to look at whether or not these individuals may have some underlying mental health conditions that could also be present despite having these other symptoms. So we need to be assessing, assessing, assessing. I know it's a lot, but it's so important. Um, I did include here some brief assessment tools just to screen for these things. The first one is the suicide risk assessment, the safe T assessment. This is available online. It's widely used. It's pretty simple. Um, as far as depression inventories, we have the PHQ-9, very easy to administer. You could also use the, the Beck depression scale. Um, as far as anxiety inventories, we have the GAD-7, again, very simple, easy to administer. And remember, PTSD and prolonged grief disorder can co-occur. And I would mention here, you know, it, it would be helpful also to ask about substance use and to assess if you suspect there's substance abuse to assess for that as well and to refer as needed. So treatment. One of the deficit areas in most educational programming for mental health professionals, based on my experience, is clinical treatment training on evidence-based treatments that can effectively address the needs of individuals dealing with PTSD and prolonged grief. When you think back to graduate school or medical school or your practicums, I wonder how many of you actually had training in evidence-based treatment for these conditions. For most clinicians, this is going to require an individual motivation to gain the knowledge, skills, and expertise to confidently treat these disorders. And I want you to know training is available and it doesn't require extensive long-term efforts it's not gonna be years and years and years of training. It just requires a commitment to begin the process and a willingness 
to take the first step. And today I wanna to briefly highlight options for evidence-based treatments that work very well. And that can be learned relatively quickly and easily. And I'm also gonna tell you about some organizations that might be able to help you to do that. So let's discuss the most effective evidence-based treatments. And we're gonna start with PTSD. There are three highly effective treatments for PTSD, and these include EMDR, CPT, and prolonged exposure therapy. And medication can also serve as a tool to mitigate symptoms and to assess clients in managing distressing psychological symptoms that impact functioning. So I'm going to show you a little video here to tell you a little bit about those. Diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. You might be thinking, does therapy for PTSD really work? Or what about medications? Well, there are treatments that work and you have choices. We're going to show you PTSD treatments that are evidence-based, which means they've been proven to work in multiple scientific studies. Two of the most effective PTSD treatments are cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure. Both are cognitive behavioral therapies, CBT for short. CBT is far from just talking you'll learn skills to manage your PTSD symptoms. Cognitive processing therapy teaches you how to change negative thoughts about your trauma, which can have a big impact on how you feel. Prolonged exposure helps you confront memories and situations you've been avoiding since your trauma. This gets easier with time, and eventually, you won't need to avoid them. Another effective therapy is EMDR, which involves thinking about images and feelings that distress you while doing rapid eye movements. This can help you change how you react to trauma memories. Therapies like these usually take three to four months of weekly visits, and improvement can last for years. Medications are another effective option. The best medications for treating PTSD symptoms are antidepressants, specifically SSRIs and SNRIs. Antidepressants work by helping brain cells communicate better, and that can make you feel better. Improvements in your PTSD symptoms will last for as long as you keep taking them. You might have heard about benzodiazepines or benzos. In the past, doctors prescribed these anti-anxiety medications for PTSD. New research shows anti-anxiety medications may interfere with therapy and do not improve PTSD. These medications can also lead to harmful side effects like confusion, fogginess, and accidents or falls. If you're taking benzodiazepines or other medications with potentially harmful side effects, like atypical antipsychotics, talk to your doctor about whether you should safely stop them. There are more effective options for PTSD. It's common to have other problems at the same time you have PTSD, like chronic pain, depression, substance abuse, a history of traumatic brain injury, or insomnia. Often treatments effective for PTSD can help with these problems too. In other cases, your doctor might suggest an additional treatment. For example, there's a special type of cognitive behavioral therapy called CBTI. The I is for insomnia. CBTI teaches you skills that can improve your sleep, even after just a few therapy appointments. Some antidepressants can help with sleep too, and there is a medication called Prazosin specifically for nightmares. So, where do you start? Talk to your provider about which effective treatment options are right for you therapy, medications, or maybe both. And remember, it's always important to talk to your doctor before stopping or switching medications. For more information, visit the National Center for PTSD website at www.ptsd.va.gov. To find a mental health provider, click the Get Help for PTSD button or see success stories at About Face. Okay. So I like that. It was a real comprehensive video that, that specifically talks so about these, excuse me, these evidence-based treatments. So we're going to talk first about EMDR. And EMDR is a psychotherapy that enables people to heal from symptoms of emotional distress, um, you know, through uh, this eight-phase treatment protocol. You know, we're looking at three time periods, the past, the present, and the future. And we're starting by focusing on past disturbing memories and related events. Um, then we move to current situations that might be causing distress and future interactions and how we might want to relate in the future. With EMDR therapy, these items are addressed using this 
eight phase treatment protocol where you take history, you do some resourcing with the client, you develop a treatment plan uh, based on their target. You do the desensitization process, which is done through bilateral stimulation. That can be auditory sounds. It can be visual back and forth eye movements. It can be tactile tapping. Uh, and um, once we've gotten through that, we do an installation phase, a body scan, a closer, closure session uh, piece, and a reevaluation at our next session. And EMDR doesn't take years. It, it moves. I had someone call it therapy on speed. I swear that it really is. It, it works and you move through things pretty quickly. Caveat here, it's very intense. Um, type of treatment. So, you know, we do want to make sure we have that resourcing piece done very, um, in a very strong manner that people feel confident they're going to be able to handle whatever sensations or emotions come up in the course of processing. I did include um, just a video here, which you might want to check out. It's called the Introduction to EMDR Therapy, and this is by Emdria, the EMDR International Association. And you can check out their website for some resources on how you can seek out training. I don't recommend doing, um, you know, a half-day workshop. There are some really important things that you need to consider in relationship to whether or not this treatment is right for a client. And I don't think that those types of programs uh, provide extensive enough training. So I, I would suggest you do it with a certified trainer. Then we have cognitive processing therapy. Again, this is entitled Cognitive Processing Therapy for PTSD. It's available on YouTube and it gives you more information about this treatment. Basically, um, it consists of on average 12 weekly sessions with a therapist. It often, well, it does include some out of office uh, practice assignments. And it focuses on how we make meaning of the trauma, specifically in relationship to safety, trust, power and control, esteem, and intimacy. Um, there is a, a, a link here to the Strong Star Training Organization, which is a non-for-profit that works for, uh, with the government to train clinicians who, work, who are treating like first responders and military personnel. But even if that's not your, your, your main population you serve, if you might be serving them in some way at some point, maybe you know um, down the road, or maybe you see one or two here or there, you could still apply to get trained through their organization. And it's very well organized. They do provide free support, weekly, one hour consultation sessions after you've completed the training. Um, and I found it to be a very well organized and uh, a really good program to get trained in this. Um, then we have prolonged exposure therapy for PTSD. This is on average, give or take 15 weekly, 90 minute sessions. And this works best for clients who are experiencing a lot of avoidance behaviorally. So they're not feeling comfortable in certain situations. Um, and and it, it, it's pretty intense, but we do do a, a piece where we teach them some relaxation skills, some breathing exercises, and the exposure work takes place inside and outside of the session. The exposure is talking about the trauma with the therapist, making meaning of it, processing emotions, and then doing more outside of the sessions um, as far as behavior. Now we, I just want to touch on medications, some of the most commonly prescribed medications for PTSD. Um, I, I would note here that 70 to 80% of individuals with PTSD have sleep disruptions. And I've listed here some of the medications that are used for those sleep concerns. As mentioned in the video, prozozin is uh, one of the more commonly prescribed medications for that. Uh, CBTI, as also mentioned in that video, is very effective. And it's not difficult to learn, and there are several resources where you might uh, be able to gain those skills. I want to talk about prolonged grief disorder treatment. Now, while prolonged grief disorder is a new clinical definition uh, describing the impact of disrupted grieving, the symptoms are not, and complicated grieving is not a new concern, and we do have effective treatments for this issue. 
we've identified um, that we do have previous treatments that are evidence-based for complicated grief. Okay, so that was this previous kind of definition here. And we're now applying this treatment to what we consider prolonged grief disorder. And we're continuing to study its efficacy. One such treatment, prolonged grief disorder therapy, previously known as complicated grief therapy, is well-researched by the National Institute of Mental Health. And it's currently being used. Another grief-specific treatment, prolonged grief cognitive behavior therapy is also being studied. And we've already discussed EMDR and its usefulness for the treatment of PTSD. Um, EMDR is an effective methodology in the treatment of grief-related problems. So if you have a client that you might have PTSD and prolonged grief disorder co-occurring, EMDR might be something to consider. Okay. So starting with prolonged grief disorder therapy, pro previously complicated grief therapy, the aim is to facilitate adaptation to loss and to elicit and address loss-related stuck points. Stuck points are the thoughts that are keeping us stuck in non-recovery. And this has seven healing modules that work, um, that, that the client is able to work through with the clinician in order to address that. Um, you know, what we want to use is a well-defined procedure. Uh, this is protocol oriented and it's in a planned sequence. Uh, the sessions are structured in a, in a kind of similar manner to CBT, beginning with a review and agenda, moving to a loss focused, followed by a restoration focus and ending with plans for the upcoming week. And if anyone has questions about research on this, I can give you more information. I would suggest checking out the Columbia School of Social Work Center for Complicated Grief. They have training materials available for purchase and they have some free resources as well. Uh, then we have prolonged grief, cognitive behavior therapy. This is an experimental treatment for prolonged grief and it's an integrative cognitive behavioral approach that includes structured exposure and cognitive restructuring. Altogether, prolonged grief CBT consists of 20 individual sessions plus four optional sessions within six months of a manualized treatment. The initial seven sessions focus on motivation, developing individual goals, and after further exploration of the patient's situation and psychoeducation, they're taught relaxation techniques, and nine central sessions focus on exposure and cognitive restructuring. Um, exposure sessions are scheduled to last a little longer if necessary, up to 100 minutes to allow for intense emotional processing. And the four final sessions focus on loss integration, future prospects, while maintaining a healthy bond to the deceased. And EMDR does have an excessive grief protocol that can be used when there's a high degree of suffering, self-denigration, and a lack of remediation over time. Again, we're looking at target memories in the past, present triggers, and the future. And there is research that shows that EMDR therapy can show successful results in a shorter time than other treatments used for complex uh, persistent complex behavior disorder, our previous definition. So in summary, um, you know, I asked a question at the beginning of our meeting, and that was, what are you willing to do to fulfill your motivation for attending today? And I asked that question again, what next step could you take to increase your skills your knowledge, and to better meet the needs of your community. Could you partner with us as a supporter? Could you refer a client to one of our support programs? Might you share some of our resources? Could you increase your screening tools when initiating intake? Could you enroll in training for one evidence-based treatment? There are so many small steps that you could take and we are so grateful to be a part 
of initiating that process for you. Uh, I do appreciate, again, you participating with us today. Uh, I would note that next month is Hope Tober Month for Return to Zero Hope. And, you know, if you would, if you've um, learned something in this, this webinar today, you found it beneficial, um, and you would like to support our programs, please feel free to donate at our website at rtzhope.org slash donate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jen. That was really, really informative and I learned a lot and I hope you all did too. Like really good stuff. 